In this video, I want to talk about a few guitar trends that, to me at least from my experience, seem to be becoming more common and accepted within what we all do as guitar players. The first one I see becoming more and more common is we seem to have accepted thinner strings, and this totally includes me. Rick Beato put his video out on thinner strings about four or so years ago now, and at the time of this recording, it's approaching three million views, so I'm guessing a lot of you would have seen it. It's called You're Probably Using the Wrong Guitar Strings, and as a die-hard 12 or 13 gauge player, I was very skeptical. I should caveat that by saying I do usually tune lower than standard. And I have to admit, even over YouTube, I could hear the results clearly, and the lighter strings really did sound way better. Of course, it's subjective, and you may think the opposite, but it definitely caused me to revisit something that I hadn't in a, in a really long time. And I started experimenting with uh, string gauge, and I'll be honest, not only was I getting better and clearer sound, it, it was also much more fun to play. Maybe in the long run after spending so many years on massive strings, it probably helped what, with hang uh, strength and control, I, I don't know, but I definitely hear now more and more players opting for lighter strings. A quick scroll through the comment section on that one video shows that he opened a lot of people's eyes and, and minds on the subject. And I think as guitarists, we sometimes become set in our ways and it, it can be quite difficult to get us to try new ideas. Second on my list is getting high gain tones from pedals. And it here seems a good place to mention that if you're new to my channel, I mainly focus on heavier guitar sounds like heavy rock, metal, 80s rock, uh, pop punk, new metal, you, you get the idea. So keep that in mind, this is from my perspective. The Friedman BEOD came out in 2016 and the MXR EVH 5150 pedal was released in late 2015. And of course we had high gain pedals before that, but I feel they become far more accepted by more players around this kind of time. Yeah, we had everything from DS1s and Metal Zones up to Wampler Triple Rex before that, but still a high gain valve amp was usually the go-to 5150 rectifiers dsls but as a gigging guitarist in heavier kind of circles i noticed that many more players were opting for more pedal platform style amps with a selection of different high gain pedals instead of being stuck with the same 5150 sound, you had the option of going between like a Friedman sound or a diesel or a Bogner Uber shell. And it's so much cheaper too. Like you can get something like this hand-wired boutique high gain pedal. It sounds amazing. It's, it's probably the best high gain pedal I've ever heard. It's, it's got a valve in it, it's analog, it's you've got unlimited tweaking with all these controls. It's called the TODP by Brilliant Amps and, and they make like 5,000 pounds or I've heard of like 7,000 pound amps and, and upwards and you can get a pedal made by the same engineer for like I think about 200 pounds, 230 pounds maybe. How mad is that? And we're definitely lucky to be living in this time as guitar players. I'll try to remember to uh, link this in the description. Actually, this is the perfect place to ask. Uh, please hit the subscribe button if you've been enjoying this video. It doesn't cost anything, but it helps me out more than I can more than I can tell you. Thank you so much. Third on my list is the availability of guitars with stainless steel frets. I think they were initially introduced by Parker Guitars back in the 90s, but obviously not the most accessibly priced guitars or the most desirable, depending on who you ask, not me. I think they're cool. But now I have like two 300 pounds Hardy Bentons with stainless steel frets, and yeah, you might hate Hardy Benton and their FX, but just as an example, or if you look at those EART guitars on Amazon, like four or $500, gets you something amazing with perfect frets with the ball lens. They've become so much more accessible. Some people say they don't like the sound or the feel of them, some people say there's no difference at all. I think that you can feel a difference, it may well be in my mind, but in my opinion there's a slightly more pronounced tap as the uh, strings hit the frets. The notes become a bit more chirpy, like the transient or initial start of the note is, has a bit more attack. But through an amp, uh, especially high gain, which is where I spend the majority of my time, it's just not really noticeable. I have a Schecter C1 Elite and firstly it's an unreal guitar. It's like having a Jackson PC1 at a third or, or a quarter of the price. But the frets are just as smooth and glassy as the day that I got it. I just add a little bit of fret, uh, fretboard conditioner every so often during string changes, buff it up and it's just perfect. Fourth on my list, and again, this is within heavy music, is the popularity of offset style guitars. And yeah, they've always been a thing in alternative and indie kinds of music. But when you see people like Jim Root and uh, Rob Caggiano and newer bands like Spirit Box, you know it's become accepted in the world of rock and metal. Have a look at the Mirror guitar and the Gojira Olympic opening ceremony if you haven't already seen it. I'm sure you've already seen it by now. Yeah, they're not exactly the, the traditional single coil equipped guitar in classic colors with badly designed vibrato systems, but they're still offsets and we just kind of made them our own. It's no different to what we did with Superstrats or Hot Rodded Les Pauls really. 
it just took us a bit longer with offsets. I can imagine it's probably annoyed the purists very much, the kind of people that are probably crying in the comments section below complaining how this video is from a metal guy's perspective. Like, yeah, obviously this is called YouTube. This is my channel and my opinions. I'm literally sitting in front of a diesel VH4. What did you think this was? I love these people. Thank you for the engagement. So yeah, offsets. I think they're cool. I love seeing Evertune and Fishman Fluence equipped offset styles in rock and metal. The last point on my list was gonna be the availability of Bakes Maple at lower price points, just like the stainless steel frets, but I think I'm gonna instead give that an honorable mention. It's cool that it's available on more budget guitars and I think it's here to stay. But I decided that my last point should be the mixing of analog and digital technology, specifically amp modeling. Obviously digital delays and analog drives have, uh, for example, have, have been used together for decades. With modeling, before it felt like there were two camps, the analog people and the digital people. And it seemed like there was very little middle ground. Take the Pod XT or the X3 series, they sounded great. and. I used them when they were the current thing and managed to get some impressive sounds out of them. But when you tried adding your own analog drives and effects, it never really seemed to work well in my experience. There was often clipping and what I assumed to be buffer and impedance issues. And the two technologies just didn't really seem to go well together. And I staying with Line 6 for the comparison, the Helix seems to love analog pedals and they integrate far better into hybrid setups. Another example of the two sides coming together is in my opinion, the best way to run an amp modeler in a live situation is to use the amp sims and IRs to go direct to front of house. Then send a version without the impulse responses to, to a power amp. I'm using the Orange Pedal Baby into a 1968 at the moment. It's class AB and to me it sounds much better in a loud mix than the class D digital stuff does which still sounds really good. But it can be whatever you want. I've used uh, dedicated valve power amps like the Marshall 9100, weighed a ton, uh, or, or the effects return of an amp head or, or a combo. That way you get the best of both worlds, amp in the room style sounds on stage, and perfect studio quality tones going to the PA for the audience to hear. It's a good example of how analog and digital can work together to benefit everyone, the player, the sound engineer, and the audience. Are there any big changes either in the approach guitarists take, uh, either live or maybe in the studio, that you've noticed over the past five or 10 years? I made a video talking about things that I think are slowly dying out within heavy guitar, and you can watch that video just here. Thanks so much for watching, especially if you made it this far. I really appreciate you.